It's time to learn the good, the bad, and the ugly of being an independent VR developer, so let's get to it. You are listening to the How to Create VR podcast, weekly conversations with VR and AR professional creators, designers, and producers. Hello and welcome to another episode of the How to Create VR podcast, where I speak with professional creators, designers, developers, and producers who work on VR, MR, and AR projects. I'm Marcelo Lewin, an immersive technologies evangelist, creator, producer, and the guy behind HowToCreateVR.com. My guest today is Bob Raffae, founder, CEO, and visual director of Big Red Button Entertainment, makers of the VR game The Arc Slinger. Today, we'll be chatting all about the benefits and challenges of being an independent VR developer. But before we begin our conversation, I would like to thank my good friends at VR VR for sponsoring this episode. Thanks to their support, I'm able to continue to create great content to share with you. VR VR allows you to easily share your 360-degree photos and videos with the entire world. Plus, they now have a VR experience that lets you build 360-degree tours easily. You can access VR through the web, mobile, and all major VR platforms. You can check them out at howtocreatevr.com slash VR. Make sure you use this URL so that they know I sent you there. Bob, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. We met at VRLA. Right. It seems like it's been forever. <laughs> yes, it has. I know this year has been flying by, but we chatted a little bit. And we thought it would be great to have you here on the podcast to talk about being an independent VR developer. But before we jump into all that, why don't you expand on the background that I gave during the intro there? Sure. Thank you for having me. I was a classically trained artist. I went to Parsons School of Design in uh, New York City, got my BFA in illustration really old school dabbling into uh, computers at the time. I think I was learning Photoshop 1, so I think I just dated myself, and some primitive 3D program called Topaz. The more I dabbled in 3D, the more I fell in love with digital creation. And I assumed that I would get a visual effects job in New York as I was sending out my portfolio at the time. But a bunch of guys at this little company called Naughty Dog found my portfolio and they brought me on into their adventure, into expanding on their just signed contract with Universal Interactive, which became a one, two, and three. So I was one of the original employees. I was one of the first employees and fell in love with game development. And I was actually working at a 8-bit game studio prior to that point. And this is around 1995 where we're ushering in 3D. So fell in love with original content creation and the new technology at the time of uh, how do you actually make interactive games in 3D? And how do you actually go about making polygons and creating worlds and so on? So after we shipped uh, Crash 1 and the studio kept growing, we had a lot of success on that. Then we came over into PlayStation 2, and that allowed me to really stretch my wings as an artist as the studio was growing. Prior to that point in the PS1 days, we were all working on the pipeline as individuals. So we were doing everything, texturing, lighting, animating, and so on. And then in the PS2 days, we became more specialists. So I was able to fall into my specialty, which is what I was trained for, which is concept development and so on. And at Naughty Dog, I was kind of self-taught as an animator and fell in love with cartoony stylization and so on. So as we then turned a corner and went from PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 3, the industry had changed as well. So we were now making more adult games. So they were more M-rated, Grand Theft Auto, had to kind of change the industry. So we as a studio had to decide how to make that transition. For me, it came back full circle for doing more realistic and exploring mocap and how do you actually make a fully grounded world that became Uncharted. After having done that for about 13 years, I decided to venture out on my own. I got the entrepreneurial bug and once you get that, it's very hard to get it out of you. So I decided to, after Uncharted 1, to start Bigger Button. Here we are now, about 10 or so years later, as we work on creating original content, which is the goal of the studio. And how did you fall into VR? VR was becoming more and more in the news. Uh, it was still a lot of R&D back in, oh, I don't know, 2013, when my former boss, Jason Rubin, got the position to helm a lot of development at Oculus, I realized that, you know, Jason wouldn't be doing this unless it's really serious. I remember we were showcasing one of our games at E3 2014, as I was just kind of walking the show floor and doing the press thing. We bumped into each other. He said, yeah, you know, this the game looks good, but you got to get into VR. That's where the future is. So I said, okay, well, Jason told me I got to get into VR. I got to check it out. And I was intrigued by the technology. So we had a dev kit, and I think it was the first Oculus kit. And we put one of our titles into it and actually was my first experience of putting on the headset. 
It was actually a snowball concept where the world was snowing and it's a winter scene. And the very first thing I did is I look up and I see the snowflakes falling down. I had the impulse to stick out my tongue as you would as a kid. And I realized, wow, that's the medium really was something. I mean, it was very crude display, but I right then I realized that there's something special in this medium. So your first experience in VR, both as a creator and as a user, was really your own creation. That's right. That's unfortunately the side effect of running a studio and uh, making games is that uh, you really don't have much time to check out other content. But when you do, you know, the trade shows help and end of the year, I'm a panel lead at the Interactive Arts and Science for Best in Animation and Art Direction. And uh, I've been doing that for a while now because it really forces me to sit down at the end of the year and have to play titles because we have to submit our top five finalists for the industry to vote on, kind of like the academies. That really allows me to actually play the titles that are out there. And now we're shifting over into VR as well. So it's really hard to put aside having to have deadlines and paying the bills and so on to actually play a lot of games. But it's a really important thing to do is to check out the competition and see what's out there. Right, exactly. I mean, not just the fun part of it, right, of playing all these games, but also the research. That's right. What's your favorite VR experience as of today? Well, you know, there's a bunch that comes to mind. Jeff and I, my founding partner, who's a tech lead, Jeff and I went over to The Void a couple of years ago because we were trying to, we know that they were doing some interesting stuff. We wanted to let them know that we we're doing some premium content development. So we went over to their Utah facility and uh, tried out the Ghostbusters before it was released. And that was a really awesome experience to be using the proton shooters and to eventually bring down Mr. State Puff was a pretty awesome experience. And on the consumer market, you know, Super Hot really, I think, did a great job of defining using the controls and time dilation was really done incredibly well. Ready Dawn has done, done a fantastic job with Lone Echo. And uh, same with our friends at uh, First Contact with Firewall. That's a really nice title. I am really have enjoyed the uh, Moss, actually, on PlayStation VR. To see that little mouse character be responsive to what you're doing and having indirect control and helping them out, I thought it's a really great way of doing interactive storytelling as well as platforming in VR. So those are the titles that come to mind right away. Super Hot is definitely a classic. Everybody should try. Definitely. Yeah, I've done The Void. I've done Star Wars and Nicodemus. I think that's how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't tried Ghostbusters yet. So they were both amazing. Definitely. So what's your latest project you're working on now in VR? It hasn't been announced, actually, our involvement with it. It's a pretty massive project that we have been asked to help out with. So we're pretty excited about it. A lot of NDAs, unfortunately, keeps us from talking about what we are working on. So that's the current project. We were working on a, a pretty amazing title that, uh, unfortunately, isn't going to ship. So without getting too much into the NDA aspects of it, that's uh, the unfortunate side of where the industry is. We were close to actually completing the title, but our publishing partner decided to shelve it. So a lot of the work that we did in uh, over a year, unfortunately, is really heartbreaking that we couldn't conclude it. So without getting into too much details of that, that's the unfortunate side of being a developer and with a new medium and changing market very quickly where we just kind of got thrown into the machine and unfortunately it didn't work out well. Is that something that is kind of standard that sometimes you may be working as an indie developer on a project for a year and it gets canceled? And what are some reasons that projects may get canceled for? That's a great question. And there's a lot of different things that can go wrong with a project. Obviously, when a developer and a publisher come together, it's because there's been a lot of conversation about who they are. We as an independent developer are constantly showing our work at various trade shows. That's where we went, you and I, at the VRLA as we were showing Arkslinger. And we as a team are always creating original content that we are looking for publishing partners. So in this day and age, it's impossible to do a paper pitch, as it's called, where you take a concept on a PowerPoint with some pretty graphics, if you happen to have some concept artists who are able to do that. It's virtually impossible to get that sold unless you have a tremendous record with that publisher. So typically what has to happen is that you have to put up your own sweat equity to create a demo that showcases what's so special about this title. And typically publishers really need to see that in order to advance the conversation and get serious because they need to see who you guys are. Uh, as a developer, you have your pedigree. And if you don't have anything that you've shipped in the past, then your demo is the only thing that speaks for you. And then they look at, are you actually addressing what is a feature innovation in this concept? What are the core uh, pillars of the project? And are you communicating that effectively with this prototype? What is it, the part that you're showing me that's really special? 
And once you get past all those conversations, a lot of times it's rare that your concept will get picked up for funding, which is what happened with our friends at Google with Arxinger. Is that Arxinger, I'll talk about how that came about. But the reason why some of the projects go off tracks is everybody starts out with tremendous intentions, uh, well-intended goals for the project. And a lot of times there's a feature creep comes in where unintended, well-meaning feedback based on discovery of the prototypes and the development along the way, for various reasons, you lose sight of what the core concept was and you start to say, have a lot of conversations like, this is awesome. It'd be cool if we do this. But on the other side of it, if you don't take something off the table, then that's where feature creep comes in. And then you start slipping behind your milestones. A lot of times I find that especially in VR, there's a lot of new media partners and they don't understand necessarily the cadence of publishing. And there's a lot of miscommunication potentially, and we have been certainly guilty of it. For example, on our last project, we were focusing on the core mechanics. We were trying to get the foundation of the product working and our publishing partner was in agreement with us for the most part, but due to various changes that was happening internally there, they just canceled the project on us and it told us it was because we were not showing the things that were important to them. But as we were building the mechanics of building the core technology and making that it work functionally and mechanically, I realized that the things that are important to them, even though we as veteran game developers might see as a secondary feature, we have to continually communicate to them as to why we're making the changes or the choices we're making in production. And as long as the publisher and developer are very open about issues that are coming up and are able to have a conversation about it, I think Typically, the conversations lead to a path of action and ultimately work towards the betterment of the product. Because game development is about making a lot of compromises and choices along the way. It's very rare to have the founding vision, the starting vision of the product, be really the ultimate ending vision because you discover things along the way. Certain assumptions don't work. So you have to be very quickly prototyping aspects and making sure that you can actually hit your deadlines with the quality that's necessary and so on. So in my experience, we've had actually had a few titles that were canceled, unfortunately, because of miscommunication and expectations that were not so much grounded from my perspective, from the non-gaming partners. And that's where a project can get in trouble. So how do you strike the balance between what's important for them, the publisher, and what's important for you? Because things can change along the way, but there are some core things that may be important to you that you really don't want to change about the game. So how do you strike that balance Because ultimately, at the end, they have to make money, you want to get paid, you want to see the vision come through, right? So it's a balance of all that. How do you work through all that? That's a really delicate thing. Because first of all, the client's always right. So they are the client, they are paying for it. If they feel like they're not being heard, and they're not seeing what they want to see in the product, then the relationship can sour, and they will feel like they're not getting their money's worth. It's our job as developers to let them know the potential pitfalls and suggest ways to remedy it. But at the end of the day, they are paying the bills and we have to find the right balance of making sure that they are kind of are protected from themselves. And I say that, I know that could sound condescending, but when a lot of game executives, even at AAA studios, don't play games and A lot of times the process is very opaque to them and it's a black box. And that problem is compounded by people who are coming new to VR. And what happened the past couple of years, there has been a lot of interest from media companies. They see it as an extension of what they do, whether it's uh, film or TV or whatever it might be. And there's a, a huge learning curve. The good news is I'm seeing a lot of smart people getting really experienced and wiser about game development. A lot of the conversations were happening with media companies who are, let me back up a second. And the reason why I keep saying media companies is because right now where it is in in VR as an industry, the people who are actually investing in projects are usually first party. So you have Oculus, you have Sony and so on. So those are first party individuals and they have a lot of experience having ship titles. So they understand what they're looking for. A lot of times you have a new media, you have old media trying to get into it because they see now we have a medium that we feel is a better way of extending what they do as storytellers. And they haven't gone through the process of actually prototyping and using the mechanics and building on the foundation because ultimately it's an interactive medium. It's a sit forward medium, meaning that you engage with it. And it's not a sit back medium where old media of film and TV, you have no connection to the interactivity. So you fall into empathy by seeing the story play out. But once you're connected to the agency of the characters of the mechanics of the game, you can make creative choices. 
And if there's a disconnect between the mechanics and the story, then the gameplay feels bad. So we as game developers who have been doing this for 20 plus years, always harp on mechanics first. And I'm hearing that a lot now from a lot of media companies that are staying around and are investing more into the experiences. So I'm ultimately optimistic about where the industry is, and it's just part of the learning curve, unfortunately. A lot of times you have to pay for that experience. The best way to grow is to frame it with success and failure, because once you live within the parameters of what's a great successful title and how did it fail, that's what makes you a wiser publisher and developer. Well, and there is a lot of experimentation going on because it is a semi-new industry, right? VR in general. So people are trying out a lot of things. And like you said, especially on the media companies, they're really creating creating these VR experiences that are more like basically flat video inside of a VR. That's right. And it's because, like you said, a lot of them, and it's not putting on anybody, but a lot of them haven't experienced VR, haven't played the games, don't understand the mechanics, the interactivity that's required in that. And maybe part of that problem is if you're a VP, part of your job is you've got to give feedback, right? So you can check that off your checklist, whether it's good feedback or not. That's right. I think that's that balance you have to strike, right? Because you have to take care of that customer because ultimately you're getting funded by that. That's right. And ultimately every relationship we have, whether it's just our casual relationship with our friends and family or whether it's a professional relationship, it's all about building trust. And you build trust by being able to rely on that individual to know that they're going to make the right choices. If that trust is frayed by lack of communication, by misunderstanding, by conflict, the project is doomed. So it's been my experience and something I strive for as I continue to make games and learn from my mistakes is that we have to communicate issues early and often and make sure that it's a dialogue because I'm also not living in our client's shoes. I don't know what kind of pressures they're under. I don't know what are the things that are important to them. But as a seasoned game developer, it's my job to make sure that we navigate through development to find the best outcome and a ship product possible. It is a dialogue. So it's important to talk about issues that come up early and often and be able to find solutions together. And I think if that happens, the trust becomes stronger and stronger and you continue to work together as a team and the developer publisher relationship and so on. Well, and I think as a seasoned game developer, part of your job is also to educate the client without sounding condescending, right? Guiding them through the process without saying, hey, I know better than you. That's right. So let's talk about now the whole process of the actual development. How do you approach VR projects and how much subject matter research do you have to do before you even start the project? Well, the way we work on uh, original content is that we as a team look at what is exciting for us. What do we want to do that is interesting and uh, what is going to be the advantage of that? Why is that going to make the consumer excited and why is that going to get the publisher excited to fund it and so on? So our process as a team has been this way for the past 10 years in that we put out a lot of times either there's, um, let me back up for a second. So I founded a company because again, I love original content development, which is what I fell in love with at, at Naughty Dog. There was a lot of ideas that I wanted to flesh out into games, so I just put my money where my mouth is and started funding the studio out of my own pocket. Throughout the years, we've gathered a lot of talented individuals who are very creative and have the same passion to create original content. So we have worked out the process of sometimes the vision comes from me, and that was more in the early years, as I mentioned. But more so recently, we have requests for proposals, these RFPs, that we send out internally that states what platform are we going after, and if it's VR, because we do AR and traditional development as well. If it's VR, what's cool about the concept, what's the feature innovation about it, what is its competition, or what's its comparative analysis, and how does it enhance on what those other games are doing, and how does it stand out in the marketplace, what are some of the risks of the project. And we put it out there, each individual who wants to contribute to that has an idea, has to write a basic documentation. Sometimes people get together in teams of two or three, and they work on that. Visual aid always really helps to communicate what it is that you're trying to build. We vote on that as a team. A lot of times the best presented, the best idea gets a democratic uh, vote to bubble up to the top. And when we want to start prototyping, we decide which one of these projects that we want to put our own efforts and resources into it. With Jeff and myself and the other leads, we kind of sculpt it into what it needs to, how it needs to be modified in order to be 
road tested and ready to present to publishers. And from there, we go on to, you know, if they like it, they want to engage in development. We have to talk about the budgets. You know, it's never the budget that you want. So you have to compromise to some degree. Or they say, you know, we love this concept. It's very close to something else that we're doing. Would you be interested in working on this title? We're looking for a developer for it. A lot of the earlier work that we did, which was a lot of smaller demos and co-development with a lot of the other studios, it was building out and helping build out their projects or taking on full development ourselves. In case of the Arkslinger, that's exactly what the studio was founded for. The uh, original concept was Richard Robledo, our senior producer's concept, and he wanted a very gritty kind of a spaghetti Western, and the tone of it was incredibly 180 of what it uh, ended up being. And because we were doing prototyping for shooting and what really was a request on that was looking at VR, looking at the controllers, looking at the six off controllers. We said, okay, what's cool about using the controller and flinging it? And that naturally led Richard into slinging the weapons. This universe that's not just a Western, but we can put our bigger button spin on it. So we make it a blended sci-fi Western. So the concept there became 70% recognizable Western and 30% sci-fi. But from the original pitch that Richard did to the final product, we pivoted to make it stylized because our friends at Google were interested in picking it up for Daydream. And we saw that it was going to be a mobile platform. So you couldn't fall into the trap of making it hyper real because it takes a lot more resources to do that and a lot more time, which we didn't have. And when you're making it cartoony with slightly lesser display size, then it's a lot easier to see exaggerated animation and exaggerated motion and very vibrant and colorful. So Throughout this meritocratic process, throughout this team process, we finally ended up with Arkslinger, which was to make a very arcadey, fast-paced shooter that relied on slinging, whipping the controllers that make it feel good. So we looked at other shooters and we wanted to make sure that we stood apart from them. We saw that there was two angles to approach. It's either a sim. So you have a lot of actions that you have to do before you actually pull the trigger, or if it's more arcadey, and we gravitated towards arcadey as a team. So hopefully that kind of gives you a window as to our process of how do we come up with the titles. And and then there's a whole process of development and all the choices you have to make upon discovery, which I kind of talked about earlier. Right. But one thing I heard in there is that you as a developer really need to be flexible and not really fall in love with your original idea and get ready for changes. That's absolutely correct. And every AAA game or every small game goes through changes. It's being open to that. It's guarding against the original vision and understanding the spirit of it. But being open to change. So that's where you can see the subtle difference between feature creep and revisions, right? So you just have to find the right balance. On our last project that was ultimately shelved by the publisher, it started out as a different kind of a game. About four or five months into the project, after we had our first vertical slice, which is to show a functional mechanic with a near final art fidelity, the gameplay was too slow paced for what the brand, what the IP was that we're building for. So we as a team with the publisher decided to pivot, which is an expensive proposition, right? And I think that's one of the first things that I gave a lot of kudos to the publisher to be able to be brave enough to do that. But at the same time, now you just spent some portion of the budget for this learning, and how do you make that up, right? So then that's where you have to be very focused as to what it is that you're building and can you do this pivot or based on your key milestone of the vertical slice, do you ultimately decide it's not hitting the bar we want or it is hitting the bar we want and it's not what we thought it could be or it's not as cool as it could be, maybe we should just halt it. So those are also part of the real conversation you have to have for game development, when to cut bait. Right, when to stop throwing good money after bad money. Especially in this market, because where we are today, VR isn't selling like hotcakes, unfortunately. We have seen a lot of interest in VR as we go to trade shows. Like I said, we come up with these concepts, we go to pitch them, and we do this at GDC, we do the VR LA, we meet with all the various uh, people who are looking for development or who might be interested, and the funding is drying up, unfortunately. You know, there's only really first parties that are interested because it has been slow to be adopted by consumers. Even though it has incredibly high novelty factor, I have friends and family who come over and like, oh, you make VR? That's so cool. And then, of course, I put them in the headset and they're like, oh, my God, right? So cell phones come out and they're taking videos of their friends being goofy and taking that footage. But will they go home and plunk down 600 to to $1,000? Probably not. So that's been the biggest hurdle for it is the adoption. 
very tough to crack. And I know first parties are working on it and I'm seeing some really great looking content out there. But let me ask you a question on that because that's really an important point here. And it's the adoption of VR, right, for this to take off. So you touched a couple of points why it's not being adopted. One of them is it's a little bit hard to actually implement, right? You got to buy the computer, you got to have a GTX 1080, all that stuff. Then there's the cost. Do you feel when Oculus Santa Cruz, whatever it's going to be named, comes out, do you think that's when it's going to take off? Or what do you feel needs to be done for the adoption rate to go up? Boy, that's a great question. If I could answer that, I don't think we'll be having this conversation because I'll be too busy, like, you know, making the product that's going to rake it in. <laughs> um, one of the inherent challenges for VR is that it's isolating. It's bad enough that after a long day's hard work, when I come home, I have to fire up the PlayStation and download the latest content. And finally, I boot it up. I sit back and I put the control in my hands. That problem becomes a lot more compounded when I have to almost go scuba diving, where I have to clear my furniture, I have to make sure that uh, there's too many barriers, is what I'm trying to say. So you have to put on the headset, you have to calibrate it, you have to make sure it's all working. You know, it's not a social experience unless it's social VR by being connected to somebody else in that space. The advantage of a traditional console or PC experience, mostly console, is that other family members could sit back and watch what you're doing. And I guess you can, you can watch what they're doing on TV, but it's not exactly the same. No, it's not, right. And people even get sick watching. Yeah, so there is definitely an isolating process in it. I think there are some big budget titles that are on the horizon that might make a difference. And I think, first of all, you're seeing the shift towards core, where part of our conversation earlier about uh, new media companies they were trying to thread the needle of catering to mass market and kind of saying, no, we're not going to do the things that hardcore gamers expect. But right now, the people who are spending the money are hardcore gamers, you know, and you have enthusiasts and hardcore gamers who are driving the market. So that's why you're seeing this kind of a shift to the things that works for hardcore gamers, which tend to be male, males who tend to like shooters and driving and simulations and things like that. Those other experiences, there's also trend towards location-based entertainment because what the consumers are doing is not necessarily spending $600, but they're gladly spend 50 bucks for an hour of good time with their friends, go shoot some stuff and go experience some things and have some great moments and then be done with it. So I am seeing definitely an appetite for location entertainment right now. And as the consumer platforms get stronger and stronger and the barrier to entry gets reduced, I think VR is not going to die. It's not going to go away. I think it's only going to slowly grow, but it's going to take time. It's going to take time to have consumer adoption. It's going to take time to find the things that works best in VR. There was hyper concern for nausea in the beginning. And now basically because there's catering more to core, you're just like moving around very freely. A lot of games are trending that way. So there is definitely a shift now towards catering to who is buying this. But that also is a double-edged sword because it's now becoming more of a niche, right? You're not going to have families necessarily doing it. That's where I think a lot of VR executives are scratching their heads trying to figure out how do you actually make this thing be profitable instead of catering to less and less people because you're catering to the core. Right. Now that's on the gaming side. What's your opinion about where I see VR and AR taking off is in the enterprise market. I feel that VR and AR are going through the same wave as the desktop computer, the internet and the mobile phone. None of that really took off until it took off in the enterprise market, right? And then consumers ended up capturing the rest. So do you feel that VR are in the enterprise is pretty big for an independent developer right now. You make a great point that I'm kind of hyper focused on games because that's what I love building on. Sure. We're working on, but there's definitely an enterprise side of this, which VR is a great tool for training. And I personally feel that we haven't really tapped it yet for education because put me within a situation, whether it's a historic situation, whether it's some sort of scientific experience where kids are now engaged by actually understanding it for themselves instead of reading a dry textbook. I think that has a huge potential of making a lot more kids who are jaded a lot more interested, you know, learning. I personally see that there's a huge market for enterprise. It's not something that we're aggressively seeking. It could help to pay the bills. It's not what we do, but absolutely there's, there's definitely VR as a great platform for training and education. As far as AR, you know, that has its own challenges right now as well. The novelty factor of AR is very strong, but uh, how do you actually have me come back and care about having a digital content that's been either mixed reality or imposed onto what I'm looking at and holding up the phone until we have glasses that work, 
that have wider field of view and are cheap enough that consumers are going to pick it up, AR is still going to be experimental and enterprise before it becomes really mass and consumer. So let's talk a little bit about VR development specifically. What do you like the most and the least in VR development? Well, obviously, with any development, I really like seeing a product start to take its own life. That something that started out as a mental exercise of just a thought process and then it starts to actually come alive, it's really magical. And that's, I think, why my team and I stay in game development and, and do what we do. What's more challenging, it's more compounded in VR, is the frame rate. Having to make sure that you hit your 90 frames a second, or if it's 60 or on PlayStation, and to make sure that you reduce nausea. Uh, the very simple things that we take for granted, like a controller and relationship of touch, all those things that would seem very trivial become very challenging sometimes in VR. As one example, we helped Weaver do character behavior for Gnomes and Goblin, the VR demo that came out a couple of years ago, and they're still working on it. Part of the coding that we were helping and working with them on was the behavior of the candles. First, it's like, oh, let's, let's light the candle. And then as soon as you have the candle lit, now I expect that to work the way it should in real life. So I could snuff it out. If I pick it up and I put it down, it behaves differently. So <laughs> that became a side project of actually making the candle a lot more robust. And that's something that only makes sense to do in VR because it's a very ergonomic and very natural movement. And if things don't react that way, then the consumer loses immersion. So that was a very interesting process and very eye-opening that uh, VR has its own language. It has plays by its own rules and we all intuitively understand it. But we're in a vacuum in a CG world that nothing is given for free. So you have to make everything work and because of that, a lot of times things might act odd and misbehave. <laughs> that just makes the experience really wacky. And right. The immersion. Right. Well, and the other portion that I would think is room scale, right? I mean, part of the nice experience of VR is the ability to move forward, backwards, right and left. But the bigger you make the room where they move in, where they physically really have to move, the more limited your audience, I would imagine. That's something you don't have to think about when creating regular games, right? Because they're sitting down. That's correct. And if you need a play area of 10 by 10, well, now your audience shrunk by some factor, right? Because not everybody has a 10 by 10 area. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny when, you know, when I had my mom try out where we're making, it was in, uh, in Vive. So we had the, the volume and she had to walk over to something and engage with it. <laughs> but she was just, her feet were just rooted on the ground and she was trying to stretch as far as she could. Right. Because <laughs> she was just reluctant to walk in the space knowing that she might bump into something or you know she didn't have that trust of that space so it was fascinating to watch and you see that with a lot of first-time users too if they're not comfortable in vr and i think part of that is not so much because they're afraid i mean that's probably part of it too but also because of 40 years of x and y computing there was no z that's and right. people are not used to moving in the z plane and all of a sudden you can move around but we're not used to doing that exactly bob i had like 20 more questions and i don't think we got through them but unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time. I do want to ask you just two more questions. One of them is, what one tip can you give new and upcoming VR developers? You have to experiment. Get in there, get your feet wet. That's how you learn. We've had a few cases where we've uh, hired junior programmers. We hired them because they showed the ability to be experimenting and being self-taught. You have to just explore. You have to try things out and you never know where it could take you. But being always a student, just constantly seeing how much you can push it, that in itself is very interesting and not losing sight of what you're trying to build. A lot of times you might get lost in the nuance of it, but really the, the goal is to prototype something and see it work quickly. So that way you can see how it feels. And then the more expensive time and cost of it is making it look better and feel better but to me, it's just doing it. You know, I was a self-taught animator. That's because I wanted to try animation and it took a while, you know, and I haven't animated in ages. That's because there's a lot more faster animators and much better than me because I kind of atrophied those skill sets as uh, where I landed as a, a studio head and being more working on the higher level instead of in the trenches. But something I tell my kids, you just do not stop experimenting and learn it. That's a key thing. It's a great tip. What about how would you like to see VR five years from now? Well, well, obviously having technology barriers removed a bit so that way it's a lot more streamlined you can just put it on like glasses and it has a wider field of view it has a full peripheral vision 
and sixed off controls, it's a lot easier to actually build stuff and not have to worry about the frame rate and so on. So I think that's just going to get better. I would like it to be part of our mainstream ability to either decide if you want to use VR for you know training. So you go to work and you're using it to learn something or you're interacting with somebody halfway across the world. Then you come home and you're putting it on because you're having a history lesson with your kids or you're teaching them something about physics as you're experimenting in a 3D space. And then you put on the VR glasses in the evening and decide, you know what, I'm going to use the AR feature instead and do some sort of entertainment at home. So I think it is going to be an everyday part of our lives and it's just going to take time to have the adoption equivalent to when we had our cell phones and the fact that we had now Google Maps on it or some you know other maps, it became a functionality that we would never do without. And we didn't have to get the Grauman maps and so on that attach it to our cars. Once you have a practical use of that, these features that I really want, whether it's like shopping in VR or using AR to walk through the store and then take a look at coupons and everything else, I think that's when you start to see it become mainstream. And those generation of people who take it for granted are the ones who are going to be pushing the boundaries. So I'm very excited about the future uh, is, and we'll just have to take baby steps to get there. I 100% agree with you. Do you feel that Oculus Santa Cruz will help towards that end goal? I think so. It's a fantastic device. It's well-priced. So I think people who were kind of dabbling and wanted to are just standing on the sidelines until the technology is there. I think that it's going to do well. Now, we saw the same thing happen with HDTVs, right? As you made the transition from standard def to HD, the TVs were costing $10,000 at the time. But now you go into any store and there you can buy one for practically $200, right? So as the technology advances and it becomes cheaper, I think the adoption rate is going to continue and there will be mainstream uses of it that makes it very exciting to be a developer. That's why I want to make sure that our team continues to flex those muscles and have that learning. So we could build on our experience and work on some really interesting contents in the future. Yeah, definitely. Well, Bob, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was really fun speaking with you. If people want to get a hold of you or download your game, give a Twitter, whatever you want. You can go to brbent for biggerbuttonentertainment.com to check out what we're doing. And our game, The Arkslinger, is almost out on PSVR. It's already out on Oculus and you can download it on the Steam store as well. So just go search The Arkslinger. T-H-E space ARC, A-R-C, S-L-I-N-G-E-R, the ARC Slinger. Check it out. It's a really fun game. We had a lot of fun making it and some great voice acting as well. So I think you'll have a good time in it. And we'll put it on our show notes. Appreciate it. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Bob. And to the rest of you, I'm glad you were here with me. If you enjoyed this podcast, please remember to subscribe, leave a comment, and like us on iTunes or SoundCloud. For more episodes, check out howtocreatevr.com slash iTunes or howtocreatevr.com slash SoundCloud. If you'd like to watch video interviews and how-to tutorials all about immersive technologies, please subscribe to my YouTube channel at howtocreatevr.com slash YouTube. If you are ever in the Southern California area, we have a monthly meetup with lots of great VR and AR presentations. You can join our RSVP for our next meetup at howtocreatevr.com slash meetup. Finally, if you are interested in learning more about how to create VR, AR, and MR projects, please visit howtocreatevr.com. So until the next episode, I'm your host, Marcelo Lewin. Cheers everyone.